Good morning. How are you doing? Good. Hi, everybody. <sighs> Should we do this outside? Beautiful day in New York. It's like this every day here, right? I think so. Awesome. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Scott. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having me. What a wonderful opportunity to get a chance to talk to everybody about cyber investing. It's kind of a little strange for me being a CEO for all these years, and now I'm on the other side investing into cyber companies. So I um, recognize a lot of people in the room, so it's kind of fun for me. I actually have my daughter here as well, and she's up here in the back. Wave, Madeline. If you want to know nervous, you know, you get to present in front of people all the time, but you, you get to present in front of your daughter. She's up there critiquing me. It's probably a homework assignment and uh, all good. But um, I spent 17 years, uh, 68 quarters being a CEO in high tech. I always say it's 68 quarters, it's like dog years in, uh, in high tech world. Uh, you know, it's every quarter is like a year it feels like. But um, I've been lucky, I've been really lucky. I've had a front row seat to uh, the cybersecurity changes over the last 20 years. And uh, it's been amazing just watching what's happened and what's been going on. I go all the way back to uh, my days. I was CEO of Documentum. We got acquired by EMC. Right after I was uh, CEO of Documentum, we acquired uh, RSA. So I got a lot of exposure to RSA's business while I was at EMC and then became CEO of McAfee and then um, sold that to Intel. Then uh, found these two hot companies, one called Mandiant, one called FireEye, and ultimately became chairman of both those companies, which I loved. And I love FireEye so much, became CEO. I love Mandian so much, I bought it. Don't recommend that strategy all the time, but um, we had a chance to take the company public, have a wonderful uh, IPO, and uh, ended up spending uh, five years in one day doing that. And now I'm trying to be you know, a good investor, a good advisor. And what I've tried to create, and what you'll see here with my slides and things is, I try to do as much as I can to create visibility in the cyberspace. So as a CEO, you try to you know, do everything you can to kind of see the whole business. So what I've tried to focus in on is just see the entire cybersecurity market if I can. And of all the companies you'll see that I'm a part of, uh, you'll see that one of the big themes is, is visibility. So um, Bob Ackerman's here, of course, who's my partner at Allegis Cyber, where we're doing uh, investments. Um, some of the partners here from um, Momentum Cyber are here as well, where we do investment and advisory services for companies, M&A services. Um, I'm also with Optiv, so I get to see a lot of distribution and reselling in the industry, which is very helpful to see trends. Um, I chair safety and security for Delta Airlines, which is a uh, you know, Fortune 40 company, big responsibility. Have a scar or two from some breaches and things have been going on, if you want to learn about that. But it's really you know, seeing how products are used, seeing how products are being sold. Uh, I also sit on NSTAC, so I've been a presidential appointee now for nine years, and TSSCI cleared, so I do a lot of work with the intelligence community. So whatever I can do across the world to see what the trends are, that's what I, I try to focus on now. So I have 17 different things I'm a part of, which OCD as a CEO, I guess it applies in all parts of life. But what I'm hoping to do for you today is just kind of show you what I see, you know, a little bit of the trends, a little bit of the threats, a little bit of the themes, and hopefully for you, these seven major categories, and I'll emphasize this at the end, I'll show you seven major categories that I think have the greatest opportunity for cybersecurity. And I think you'll be surprised at all seven of the categories. Most people are, because these categories, I believe, are where the greatest offense is dislocated from the defense. So wherever you see offensive capability that has the biggest gap to defense, that's where the investment opportunity sits, in my opinion. And I have seven of them to show you as we walk through that. So let's take a big picture view. If you've heard me speak before, you know I've used this analogy for 15 years. It's called the perfect storm, the perfect cyber storm. And I'm gonna show you six tenants as part of the cyber storm. These six tenants, 15 years ago when I was doing presentations for McAfee and RSA um, are the exact same ones. If anything, I believe they've exponentially grown. And I believe these 15, for the next 15 years, you'll see the exact same tenants driving the cyber industry to heights we've uh, never seen, trillion dollars over the next five years kind of a spending. So real quick, what are they? Speed of innovation, right? So if you take a big picture view, what's the biggest challenge we have in cyber? Innovation's a lot faster than we can defend against. And right now, if you're running a large company, 
um, and you're trying to defend against it, you're seeing over 100 vulnerabilities a week come in from vendors. Some days and some weeks, it's even more than that. So what do you do with 100 SEV1, SEV2 vulnerabilities that are coming in across your entire architecture, mobile, cloud, network, you know, your operational technology, social environments, and you're getting 100 of these? How do you prioritize those 100 and know what to patch, what threats they might be, what's your attack surface, and how to solve that? That's one of the biggest conundrums almost every CISO has right now, is how to prioritize the speed of innovation and then patch it, manage it, and defend against it. And constantly, we have new types of architectures being deployed. We've never gotten around that. And I'm going to show you some of these major new ones that are just absolutely hurting every company that's out there. And uh, pretty interesting. Of course, all these vulnerabilities, guess what's happened? Exponential growth in the number of attackers. So right now, we see well over 800 unique groups. These are you know, uh, attacker groups. They can be anywhere from hacktivists to criminals to nation states to you know, just about any type of organized uh, group that's offensive. And more than 80% of those groups have more funding than the largest single cybersecurity company in the world does for R&D. So just think about that for a minute. So the offense, look how much money they get, and look at the hottest, most R&D-rich cybersecurity company, and 80% of them have more funding and more resources than those companies do. So where do you think the advantage is, right, on the offense? So this is a major problem. We now have 29 countries in the world that have declared an offensive group that you know, basically have a real cyber offensive warfare unit. We have 63 countries that have active defensive groups and units. Probably most of those also have offense, just haven't declared it. And almost every country in the world has declared you know, cybersecurity as a national security problem. So come a long way just watching the importance of this and what's been going on here in the world and the types of groups. We didn't used to work and worry about like nation state attacks back in the you know, first part of this century. Now we do every day. And many of them have collusion with criminal groups. And you guys know this is a, a major issue, having 800 offensive groups this well-funded. So look at the levels of danger that we're all facing today. Um, I'm trying not to be too ominous on a, on a beautiful day here in New York, but you know, things keep you up at night when you're watching what the offense can do today. And I'll show you a couple things, but it's amazing to see what advantages we're now seeing offensive cyber have, particularly in some of the next generation technology areas that are coming out. And of course, this one exacerbates it. You can almost mark it with a calendar. The moment you see a geopolitical tension in the world, guess what happens? Immediately an attack occurs. I mean, you could plot it. The next calendar, we can put the calendar out for two years at every major political event in the world. There'll be cyber attacks leading up to it, during it, and after it. And it's just part of the way the world works today. Every country's trying to get an advantage on another one. The more tensions, the more attacks. And of course, combine that with lack of governance around this area, because who's the offense? The very government who's regulating. And you end up with this perfect storm of issues. And then you throw on top of that very poor law enforcement models as a result of that, and you end up having you know, this perfect storm. And then all of a sudden this thing called anonymity occurs, and we can't track attribution very well, and you have like who did it kind of problem, and who's involved, and how do we catch them, what do we do? And I know I'm speaking to the choir, but big picture, 15 years ago, this is what we worried about. 15 years later, this is what we're worried about. 15 years from now, same issue, my opinion. This will not solve. We're nowhere near getting regulation, you know, better cooperation, you know, better ways in which we deal with our neighbors on these issues, and it just looks like you know, a, a serious environment. Of course, the legacy security providers, which I was one many, many years, have trouble keeping up. And I'll talk to you a little bit about this. When you're a CEO of a major company, you have a hard time doing anything more than developing your current product, let alone what's coming a year from now, three years from now, because of the pressure of earnings. So what ends up happening, you get this innovator's dilemma, the legacy products kind of decay, and ultimately that's why we see best of breed products come around all the time. And this is the way this little ecosystem works. So, perfect storm, but in my opinion, absolutely the most unbelievable investment scenario uh, I've ever seen. So uh, I don't know how many of you saw this report that was put out called The Winter is Coming by BTIG. You guys see this? Something to read. It's a really good report. I completely disagree with it. 
So for, whatever, for the record, I do, because I don't think there's winners coming. Because what I'm going to show you is the threat cycles drive spending cycles, spending cycles drive investment cycles, investment cycles drive major companies. We're going to see for the first time in the next five years, my opinion, prediction, the first cybersecurity worth $100 billion. Think about that. Anybody know what the most valuable cybersecurity company is now roughly in market cap? 20 billion, roughly? We're gonna see one worth 100 billion, my, my prediction, because of everything you see here. So look at the dangers that we're having, evolution of the threat. I've had a front row seat to this for a long time. Obviously, if you go back to the 1990s, you know, early part of this century, you know, what did you see? Quantity-based viruses, right? Quantity-based viruses, let's see if we can spread a virus around, Trojans, adware, spyware, many of you know all these terms. How fast can we multiply it out? At McAfee, when I was there, every day we'd write upwards to thousands of signatures, blacklisted signatures, trying to keep up like a mouse on a wheel, trying to keep up with every known signature and every known virus that was in the world. When I left McAfee, we had 68 million signatures every day that we updated. 68 million. Think about that number. That was in 2011. So we tried to write you know, generic signatures, polymorphic signatures, parasitic signatures to try to create families of these things, and we still had 68 million of them we had to block. And that's what sits at the antivirus gateways today, is millions and millions of signatures. So how do you keep up with that problem? Very difficult. And of course, as we moved on, every attack was largely on IT networks. And as we started to watch what I call the Great China IP War, Many of you have heard me speak. I had a front row seat to this. 5,571 known attacks by 22 military intelligence organizations in China. That's what Mandiant and FireEye responded to or confirmed. Now, this is our confirmation, but we had such good intelligence that we could track, for the most part, those attacks, these APT campaigns. We tracked 5,771 on American soil. Pretty amazing for a five-year period. So you want to talk about the great purge of intellectual property? This was the window that that occurred. Of course, what happened during that window? You know, we saw a massive growth of cyber spending and response that occurred. And of course, if you fast forward a little bit as you move from crime to espionage during that window, and then we get this great, what I consider Russian information war, which we're in the midst of now. And you know, these two countries were very different in the way their styles worked. China was pretty noisy, at least the way we saw it. They often didn't care that they were caught. They would write comments in their code around you know, things that were obvious that they were written in Mandarin, and it was them. In fact, they were famous because they were called the comment crew, and we indicted them on the front page of the Wall Street Journal during my time, and many of the comments were like, fuck you, America, right? It was not too hard to describe what they were doing and they would just attack our network, steal as much as they could, until we ended up with a peace treaty with China in 2015 summer, which slowed it down a little bit, but geopolitical tensions in this administration has ramped that back up. So now we have a little bit of a cyber sandwich. We have China on one side, Russia on the other, if you're America's view, and of course America's quite good at this game too, and we have probably the greatest superpower conflict in cyberspace we've ever had, by far. And so gloves are a little bit off, and we're seeing just a lot of information integrity issue, intellectual property attacks, and back and forth. It's a pretty interesting state of things if you are uh, in the world, particularly government on government type attacks at the moment. Of course, ransomware came along, so just, wow, pretty crazy growth in a 15 year period. So what happens along the way? If you take the threat landscape and kind of boil it down to quantity-based viruses all the way to quality-based APTs, what happened during that time frame? Watch what happens to the cybersecurity industry during that time. When I ran McAfee, not a very big market. $3 billion market, antivirus, pretty good. We grew. As you got into the next stage where firewalls and refreshes and network defense in depth occurred, market doubles, more than doubles. And of course, threats started to drive this. 18% CAGR. Now look a couple years later, $16 billion market. I love putting virtual machines up there because that's FireEye, but um, forgive me. But lots of growth here, as you saw APTs emerge. Another major expansion doubling again. Now look where the market is today. You could argue it's off by a billion here or there, but a 90 plus billion dollar customer spend market, 
probably exceeding 100 billion in 2018, maybe more. So threats drive customer spend clearly, the association with that. Now watch the corollary to it. Watch the investment side. Here's the investment side. Amount of M&A activity, financing activity, jumping. So we're gonna see over $22 billion of finance activity here in the current state. 16.5 billion in one year going into cyber from a lot of different groups. 95 billion over a couple year period in M&A. And you can almost track threat cycle, spend cycle, vendor cycle, consolidation cycle, and there it goes. My opinion is you're just gonna keep seeing it. There's no way around that. That's why I'm so bullish on cybersecurity is because this threat and this domain is so unmanaged from all the perfect storm reasons I showed you that there will be vendors who can't handle this transition from one threat landscape to another, but no matter what, the spending environment just continues to go. There's no way, my opinion, around it, particularly as every country in the world arms themselves for this battle. So let's talk a little bit about kind of what this means. Whoops, let's see if I can pop this up. That slide didn't work. Okay. Isn't that a good slide? Was it hacked? It's just like one slide. Um, sorry about that. Let me just talk to you. I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm seeing here for a second, just in terms of trends. That slide has a little bit of trends thing on it. And I'll just, I'll just go back so you uh, leave it blank. It's more fun. Um, so what's happening trend-wise? You know, so right now we have almost 3,000 cybersecurity vendors uh, out there in the world. We're seeing close to 500 new cybersecurity companies born every year. That number looks like it's in a consistent uh, path. So pretty interesting to watch the number of vendors grow. What we track is how many vendors do you think are gonna get some sort of liquidity? Let's just say it's not 3,000. So of the 3,000 between M&A and IPO, we're gonna see less than 1% get some sort of liquidity scenario over the next three to four years. So what's gonna separate if you're an investor looking at cybersecurity companies and saying 3,000 of them, 1% get a real exit, an M&A exit or some sort of IPO exit, how do you discern these companies from an investment point of view? That's not to say 2,900 of them are gonna die, it's just to say 2,900 of them aren't gonna see some major return probably on their, on their growth. Because the ability to get from zero to 10 million, much easier. The ability to get from 10 to 100 million, pretty hard. The ability to get from 100 to a billion, really hard. The ability to sustain yourself above a billion, there's only a couple of them in the world. So, you know, how do you start to think about investing? And part of what you'll see here, if you saw this slide, was I always teach this to the CEOs. Know your window. What does that mean, know your window? If you don't understand what the threat landscape is, how much time you have to execute that threat window, and in that you know, window of market opportunity, you lose. When I first joined FireEye, I knew my window wasn't that long. There's just no way around it. APTs were a really um, difficult issue to deal with, but it wasn't like I could invent a sandbox and nobody else could do that. So by the time I got public, I had 150 competitors. And we grew the business from almost zero to a billion in sales a year in a three-year period. But I knew my window. I knew I had to execute in that window because eventually I'd have all kinds of competition. Maybe the APT threat would disappear and you have to do it. So any company who you really look at, do you understand their window? How much time do they have? How much competitive moat do they have? And can they execute in that window? Can they raise the capital? Do they have a good management team? Are they able to execute a go-to-market model key? And I always say this axiom for you if you're thinking about investing, intellectual property is a game of inches. Go-to-market is a game of miles. So what I'll see is companies in a sector, there'll be 10, 15 companies, and the intellectual property difference is they can't even tell the difference. A little feature here, a little feature there. Maybe they'll tout an architecture difference or not. Game of inches there game of miles if they can figure out how to sell, distribute, manage, create profit. Wow, what a difference. Management teams figuring that out is the 1% rule. That's what I look for. You can find 20 companies in a sector, you're like, which one has the eye of the tiger to win this game? And which one doesn't? And it's amazing watching how many fail to get over these humps because they just don't understand the window, how to execute to go to market, and what to go do. 
So pretty fascinating problem that we're facing is a lot of funding, a lot of companies in a category, and only a few break out. When I was at FireEye, we had competitors like Dumbalas, Fidela, what was it, yeah, Fidelis, Dumbala, you know, Last Line, all these companies, all about the exact same as FireEye. The difference was execution on the go-to-market. And eventually, you know, we were able to win and get enough market share to grow. So what a difference that makes as you think about it. And I always tell people, yeah, good luck filing a patent. You know, don't even bother filing a patent. It doesn't even matter. I mean, it matters. But, I mean, by the time you file a patent and get a patent, your window's over. So stop even spending time on that area. And it's just a waste, in my opinion, to worry about that or even like checking into it, one man's, one man's view. So think about this as we go forward. You know, here is some things for you to think about. When I think about where new investment opportunities are in cyber, here's how I think about it. When you go back in time, wherever the greatest dislocation of offense and defense was, as you see here on this, my, right, my right-hand side, your right-hand side, you see the greatest opportunities for investment. So at times, it was like, all right, these computing devices like PCs were quite vulnerable. Windows was doing everything they could, Microsoft, everything they could to patch it, but it was very vulnerable. Everybody attacked that. Big market emerges with antivirus. Off it goes. We watch cloud come along, public clouds come along, industrial, social, satellite, and I'll show you these in a second. But it's amazing the dislocation occurring in these latter four areas where you can hardly count the number of cybersecurity companies on one hand that are actually solving these problems, but how good the offense is in these areas. And whenever you see a big attack surface and low visibility to the problem, wow, is there an investment opportunity and a risk? And those do go hand in hand. So let me show you a couple of these that I really, I think are big. Sorry, these slides are a little, a little off. So left to right here for you. First one that I'm really, um, Big on right now, I call it drones and domes. So what's drones and domes? Have you heard this concept before? So right now, we're gonna watch in the next three years, most likely, what's called beehives. Beehives are these uh, ground stations, base stations, that enable you to deliver goods via drones. They'll be in every city in the world over time, assuming the FAA eventually regulates it, but they'll come. And the idea behind it is you can deliver packages via drones to whatever business home you have, last mile delivery. Amazon, I think, believes through Amazon Prime Air, which they've launched, that they can launch 3,000 drones per base station, and they'll have hundreds of base stations around the world. That's just one vendor, Amazon. I'm on the board of Delta Airlines. We're considering the same thing. Every time a plane takes off and lands, we fill the belly full of cargo. What are we going to do? Have our drone fleet right outside that and deliver the goods to your, or your bags to your house. We want to be able to deliver these things in 60 minutes or less if you could you know, order a product. So eventually you're gonna see massive numbers of drones flying in the sky, especially in unregulated countries first. And eventually here in America, it's coming no matter what happens. So what do we have to do to protect that? We have to build network defense on where? Our rooftops. So instead of doing network deep packet inspection on your physical network, you're gonna do a LIDAR, sonar-like model on your roof. And you're going to be looking for communications coming into your dome. And these cyber domes are going to sit over every facility, in my opinion, in the world. Military, airports, stadiums, anywhere where there's a risk. If I'm a bad guy, why would I go get an assault rifle and try to smuggle it into a stadium? I'll fly a drone in with 50 kilos of dynamite. And if it's not detected, wow, what kind of damage could I do? So the ability to buy one for $500 at Fry's Electronics and fly it a mile and a half in the sky at 50 kilometers per hour with 50 kilos of package is what we have today. So the question is, what defense will we put in place to stop that from happening? My opinion, you'll see a handful of these companies. There's about five or six uh, really interesting technologies that put little mesh networks above your facility and constantly track it. They have the ability to EMP or DDoS, a drone that comes into your space, and eventually they'll be able to knock the drone out of the sky with some sort of DDoSing or electromagnetic pulsing, or even Kevlar netting, or some sort of mechanism to capture the drone. Really important next generation problem. That, in my opinion, is coming. And I'll show you the corollary to it in a second. Big areas, in my opinion, industrial. Probably my biggest fear is watching the industrial problem 
Why is because the offense is really good and the defense is nascent. There's a handful of companies. I'm a part of one of them. I know Galena's here somewhere. Galena, the founder of Clarity, um, developed ways to do deep pack and inspection on industrial protocols. Anybody know what industrial protocols are? These aren't your standard TCP IP protocols. These are protocols that Modbus, DNP3, Rockwell has their protocol, Siemens has theirs, Honeywell theirs, Schneider there, Airbus theirs, and there's literally hundreds of protocols that are essentially talking between SCADA devices and controllers. And these protocols need to be monitored because if there's any disruption in that protocol, you could bring down critical infrastructure. So today, there's only a handful of companies. I know Bob's on Dragos, uh, Dragos as well, but there's a couple of companies just starting out that are beginning to say, wow, there's a problem in the industrial networks. We better fix it. Everybody here of WannaCry and Petya and not Petya, one of the issues that happened with those um, ransomware and virus releases was they crossed over from IT networks to OT networks. And when it crossed over, it wiped out or halted our operational tech in some big companies. A few big ones announced, like Federal Express, Merck, and others that had their major manufacturing systems brought down because they weren't air-gapped. But people started to realize, I better start to think about how to protect all the industrial networks. In my opinion, you'll see a billion-dollar type company emerge out of that sector alone, just trying to solve an industrial cyber platform in, in the world or the rest will get acquired, something will happen, some will go public, some will get acquired. The IoT area, I'm sure you all know about. When you think about what's happening in the IoT space, I helped a company go public called Forescout recently. What's the number one thing that company did? Create visibility at the switch layer of a network to see what devices were on your network. The enemy CISOs were surprised at how many devices were on their network they didn't know about or weren't managed. Typically three times more than they thought they had. I mean, think about that. Three times more than they thought they had. And so these devices were somehow coming in, either wired or wireless, near field or some communication mechanism connecting to their network, and most of those devices were quite vulnerable. So IoT management, security around this, a lot of good, really interesting companies being formed in this space to solve IoT security, especially as it thinks about how do we protect that. How do we authenticate that IoT device? How do we create identity controls, encryption of the communications, and ultimately connecting it safely to a network, a cloud, or a satellite? So a lot of interesting vendors there. I'm involved with another one called Forge Rock that has IAM controls you can put in an IoT device on an edge controller and manage IoT securely to a cloud. I think this is where the market's moving. Going over to the third one, social and satellite. Pretty, pretty obvious issues here. Do you guys know how many companies do social network security today? To my knowledge, two. Uh, there's 500 network security companies, over 100 endpoint companies, and there's two working on social network privacy and security. A company called Social Safeguard, another one called Zero Fox. These two companies, very interesting. They created almost a SIM for social. What's a SIM for social? They're actually looking at events an information flow coming out of the social networks and digital hubs, trying to look for anomalous behavior. So if Dave DeWalt suddenly has a Twitter handle and a Snap handle and a Facebook handle, but my location and IP address are different, that would look a little suspicious. This is what the Russian campaigns were about. How do you affect that? How do you watch for anomalies across that? Do you guys know how many networks in the world right now have more than 100 million users on them? 83. There's 83 hubs and networks in social that have more than 100 million users each. 3.8 billion users online right now. Pretty amazing, 83 of them. How are you monitoring your assets, your employees, count takeover issues, false identity issues on these networks? They're all outside your own network. How do you manage them? My opinion, there'll be a billion dollar company coming out of social privacy, security, managing, almost like you would think of Splunk or ArcSight for your network, you're gonna see the same thing set up for your social environment. Last couple for you, and I know I'm running out of time, satellite. My biggest fear in the world right now is this one, bar none. Even after I said the industrial thing, satellite scares me. Why does satellite scare me so much? If you look at how much innovation is occurring 
How many devices are connecting the satellites? It's daunting. Everything, my watch, my car, every aircraft we have, all connecting uplink now and all completely reliant on satellite communications. How secure do you think satellite communications are? Yeah. Right now we have uh, 1,536 orbiting LEO and GEO satellites. We're gonna launch 3,000 more in the next one year. So what's the next generation internet? Satellite mesh networks. Everything's gonna connect. It's gonna be faster service. You're gonna be all the time connected. Fiber link will be one platform for internet growth, but satellite will be another. And if you look at the consumerization of devices, infrastructure IoT devices connecting uplink, it's astonishing. Can anybody name a satellite security vendor? There's one. Well, maybe yeah, Mr. Cyber Defense can, yes. But there's not many out there today that know how to monitor satellite communications, protect and authenticate those connections, block anomalous behavior on those connections. And if you ever heard of a company called OneWeb, they're gonna launch thousands of little orbiting satellites. Uh, companies, there's a whole bunch of agricultural companies, energy companies, all launching satellites. It's unbelievable. Very interesting space. I believe there'll be a billion dollar company coming out of that domain as well. Last two real quick, cloud, obvious one. I clearly see this, bunch of emerging uh, companies. Lack of visibility here is crazy. My quick Delta story is this. We got breached uh, at Delta, uh, all public here. Painful experience, if you've ever gone through it on, uh, on the side of protecting. But we got breached through a third party vendor called 24-7. And the 24-7 was a live chat service talking to Delta.com. And we were unable to see that 24-7 was breached. And they were screen scraping and cross-site scripting from our site to theirs. And they were screen scraping credentials off 24-7. So our visibility was Delta.com. We monitored everything on the site, everything on our network. But how did we protect against a vendor hanging off our cloud, off our network? It wasn't so easy. It turned out we had 29 vendors hanging off our site. We didn't know it. 29 little revenue optimization clouds all helping us do a $20 billion commerce business online. What do we have to do now? Monitor those network connections maybe even monitor and do vulnerability scanning of their systems, make sure their contracts have it so we can scan them. But cloud isn't just your own infrastructure like Salesforce or other types of real infrastructure. It could be any type of cloud activity. Do you know what the number, you know what the number of cloud applications deployed in the average enterprise is? 928. Do you know how many of the CISO thinks are deployed in the organization? by a CISO poll, 42. Does anybody think there's a little dislocation between how many is deployed and how many are actually running? So how do we get our head around that problem? Cybersecurity investing in this area, some really interesting companies in the cloud area. Last one I'll tell you about is crypto, obviously. I think this is a major issue with blockchain and what we're seeing with major projects around crypto. Uh, I'm involved with a couple of incubators that are really focused on this area. But over the next couple of years, our reliance on cryptocurrencies is going to be unbelievable. And my opinion is someone's going to emerge here as one of the major cybersecurity vendors helping to solve, authenticate, and basically manage crypto movements, currencies, validations, all through blockchain. So interesting world we're in. Did I tire you out yet? I could talk for hours, I swear. And I'm very excited about this. But, um, Thank you for having me, really. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, you got something out of this. And uh, I'm a part of this little entity. I think I mentioned it's called, uh, whoops, go back. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Anyway, it's called Night Dragon. So Night Dragon has two companies in it, Momentum and Allegis. And I'm trying to focus again on just creating max visibility, max investment opportunities, use every angle I can to find what is the hottest domains and build them, invest in them, make them happen. Here's some of the companies that are in the Kretsu for what I've been doing. So, kind of fun. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. Cool.